Hello dear contubernales, welcome to our first warrior silhouette video. Roman legionaries peaked in the first century CE. This is when they had the best training, equipment and prestige among the populace. Well, the populace should have a reason to rejoice, as we have such a legionary with us here today. Meet Decimus Ulpius Socus, a protector of the Rhine frontier. His heavy infantry unit is deployed here to protect the empire from the Germanic threat. The state equipped him well, although the gear's costs will be deducted from his pay. Let's have a look at all this equipment with which the Romans fought their wars of territorial expansion and frontiers protection. Oh great Jupiter, are these socks and sandals? Respect. Legionaries wore mostly wool. Their hats, tunics, cloaks and socks were most often woolen. Not the perfect material for the Mediterranean climate. But here at Limes Germanicus, Socus has nothing to complain about, given that weather here can really be dreadful. This is how we ended up with socks and sandals. Caligae were invented with the Mediterranean climate in mind. There is no easier way of making them warmer than putting socks underneath. With thick enough socks, the Caligae can be even transformed into passable winter shoes. The sandal design was not only chosen due to it being good for warm weather. It consisted of less leather than a closed shoe, making it lighter. In addition, spaces between the leather straps give Caligae great ventilation. Crossing rivers and muddy terrain is much easier when you know your shoes will dry quickly after the crossing. Apart from ventilation, these spaces are also great for when a stone falls into a shoe. Instead of taking off the whole thing in order to remove the stone, you can easily dig it out with a finger. However, it most often falls out with a few more steps. Caligae have a thick and hobnailed sole. The hobnails are meant to increase the life expectancy of the shoe, as legionaries are people who walk the most around the empire. The empire with a grandiose network of paved roads. If not for the hobnails, the Caligae would take a heavy toll from all this paving. Moreover, this metallic sole gives legionaries advantage in combat by increasing their traction and making their kicks and stomps deal greater damage. Moving from bottom up, we stay in the realm of leather. Next item on our list is a Kingulum, belt characteristic of Roman legionaries. Its primary practical function was to transfer some of the armor's weight from shoulders to hips. Kingulum must be buckled up tightly for the weight to be properly distributed. Moreover, it makes the armor fit our legionary better. And the better it fits, the better it protects. With functionality in mind, one could compare it to a powerlifting belt, increasing the wearer's core stability and decreasing risk of injury. The belt's secondary function was keeping Gladius's cupboard in place. If it wasn't for King Gulum, it would be quite hard to unsheath the sword. Who knew that belts could be so crucial when it comes to hurting people with pointy metal sticks. Kingulum is also worn for its aesthetic value. The belt most often is equipped with leather strips decorated with metal elements. These metal decorations, when marching, hit each other, creating a specific sound. The camp and barrack life requires a legionary to carry with him many small items, such as a knife, wax tablet, multi-tool, a flint or many others. All of these things are carried in a leather bag on the left side of a legionary, opposing the gladius. Pera is the Latin name for the bag. With gladius already mentioned and us still being in the belt area, let's jump straight into legionary armament. Here we have a gladius, famed short sword of the legionaries. The blades found by archaeologists vary in length from 50 to 65 centimeters. Another 20 centimeters goes for a wooden, ivory or bronze handle. 
With it, we end up with a perfect sword for dense formations. The Gladius is a straight, double-edged and wide sword, from 5 to 7 cm wide to be exact. This amount of metal makes it quite heavy, but also effective at not only stabbing, but also cutting. We know there are not many slashing with a Gladius fans out there, but for Rome's sake, you could chop wood with it. Gladius is always worn on the right by the legionaries. Again, it is mostly just a practical application, as the soldier's left side is covered by a shield, which hinders an unsheathing motion. Instead, Gladius's shortness allows for easy pulling out from the right. What if a Gladius was lost mid-battle? Is our legionary left defenseless? Well, it depends on what he's doing with his pay. If all of the money is lost on women and gambling, then yeah, losing a Gladius mid-battle can be quite life-changing, or rather, life-ending. A more prudent legionary would buy himself a Pugio, a special kind of dagger that was not supplied by the Roman state. You see, our guy Socus is reasonable. On his left, we can find a Pugio, a wide and short blade which, with a scutum, works very similar to a gladius, with one exception. Here the only thrusting and no slashing theory actually works, unless our legionary is finishing off his foe by cutting his throat. Last purely offensive tool in the hands of our legionary is a pilum, a javelin that in times of need could pass a test for a spear, as it was two meters long. Pila were thrown at an enemy right before contact. The Pilum's spearhead is long, squared and bendy. The length ensures deep shield penetration. The squared shape and bendiness make it removing from a shield hard, especially when you only have a few seconds before legionaries come at you charging with their swords. The bendiness also enables a quick recycling of the Pilum. When the legions have an initiative, a pilum can be used more than once or twice during the same engagement. All that you need to straighten out a pilum is a fist-sized rock and a little bit of time. With sufficient practice, you can be throwing this thing at a distance of 20 meters or farther. Although we found 20 meters to be already a sensible throwing distance for a javelin, weighing 1.4 kilograms, especially that when charging, it takes around 8 seconds for a man to run 20 meters. Definitely enough time to draw a sword. All of these weapons, Gladius and Pugio in particular, would be quite useless at an ancient battlefield if it wasn't for... Scutum. Big curved rectangular shield made out of glued wooden slats and covered with linen. On its rams it's finished up with leather or metal. Shield's handle and user's hand is protected by a steel umbo. All of this weighs from 5 to 8 kilograms. Although scutum can also be used offensively, its primary function was purely defensive. With proper stuns taken, the shield covers almost the whole legionary. Moreover, its shape allows for execution of very effective defensive formations, like a shield wall or a testudo, the famous Roman tortoise formation. For further defense and protection, our legionary puts on his steel uniform. Underneath it, a subarmalis is worn, a linen vest padded with wool. It gives an extra protective layer of cushioning and separates skin from steel plates or chainmail. Focale, a legionary wool scarf, fulfills the same function for the neck area. Over time, it developed into a truly sophisticated piece of clothing with decorative tassels. This made Focale into a fashion trend so big that legionaries wear it often even without armor purely for good looks. Our man Socus has on him Lorica Segmentata, the most famous type of armor for an early era imperial legionary. It consists of four elements, two shoulder guards and two torso segments. 
They are made of steel plates, riveted together with leather straps. Lorica segmentata can look quite cumbersome at first, but with its many joints, it adapts itself to whatever the legionary is doing, making it quite comfortable. On top of that, tightly buckled up hikingulum transfers more weight to the hips than in case of chainmail, making Lorica segmentata even more bearable to wear. Since we are already comparing segmentata to hamata, a chainmail variant of the legionary armor, we must say that plated armor also wins in the degree of protection it provides. Although both types of armor protect well from cuts, the plated armor is better at countering stabs. On the other hand, maintenance of Lorica segmentata can be a nightmare. Because of its construction, every single plate needs to be polished and greased separately, making the whole process quite time-consuming, but also very rewarding once you're done with it. As you can see, our man Socus treats the term heavy infantry quite literally. Lorica Segmentata is not the only piece of plated armor that he is wearing. Let's have a look at his right arm. On it, he is wearing a metal sleeve called Manica. Manica is meant to prevent Socus from losing his arm. When he thrusts, and believe me, he does that a lot, his arm becomes open for attack. At that moment, a dropping blade could leave a nasty wound or even cut their hand clean off. This is why, although Manica was already invented in the 1st century CE, it gained on popularity only in the 2nd century CE during the Dacian and Marcomannic Wars, when the legionaries fought with barbarians wielding falxes and sika swords. These are forward-curved weapons, perfect for removal of enemies' limbs. Last but not least, a Galea-type helmet. It owes its name to its origin. The legionary helmet was inspired by the very similar Gallic design. It protects not only the head, but also the face and the neck, thanks to its impressive cheek pieces and neck guard. Galea, just like armor, needs an extra layer of cushioning. This is provided by a knitted or felt hat. A simple leather strip tied under a shin is used to fix a helmet in place. The helmet is reinforced in a few places. There is an additional rim in front protecting it from splitting when hit from above. On top of that, in other places like here and here, the steel is bent into wavy decorative patterns. Apart from beautifying the helmet, they also make it more resilient. During battle, Roman legionaries receive their orders with specific sounds. Every single cohort has an individual sound assigned to it. That is why Galea has these crucial ear holes that do not obstruct hearing. At the very top of the helmet, there is a handle for a cresta, used for mounting a feather plume. These plumes on daily basis are used for officers' recognition, but also have a decorative function, utilized by simple legionaries at triumphs. There you have it, a simple but well-equipped legionary from the 1st century CE, probably the heaviest infantry unit that the world had to offer at the time. It is incredible how well thought out this whole gear set is. What strikes me the most is the level of aesthetic thought put into the design. A legionary in his full armor is not only well prepped for a fight, but also just looks good. Who knew that all you needed to conquer the world was giving your boys some head and torso protection, the biggest shield that you could think of, teaching them to form neat squares and making sure that they can walk over 30 kilometers a day. Okay, there are much more things needed for world domination. In our future videos, we will surely have a look at other things that Romans used in their attempt to conquer all of the known world. Let us know in the comments what other warrior silhouettes would you like to see. In time, we can do Roman offices, gladiators, Greek hoplites and some barbarians. We also do not want to limit ourselves only to antiquity. Perhaps you can inspire us to do something else. 
Only time will tell. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to see our future videos and help us bring back the glory of Rome. And remember... Roma Caput Mundi!